So a warm welcome to all of you, lovers of New York City history, architecture, theater, and film. We're gathered today to celebrate the life and work of actors Jessica Tandy and Hume Cronin. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein Spielvogel, Chair of the Historic Landmarks Preservation Center, a group of dedicated individuals committed to informing the public about the past, present, and future of historic preservation in our city. Our warmest thanks to our co collaborators in this first initiative to involve more and more neighborhoods, to the Miracle Neighborhood Association, led by Susan Demmitt and her loyal band of really remarkable preservationists. Thank you for all of your efforts. And the members of the Murray Hill Neighborhood Association as well. Also, special thanks to the generous welcome from the owners of this building, Mr. and Mrs. Scott Hirschman. Would you like to come in and sit down, Mrs. Hirschman? Okay. To remind you, this event is being videotaped and it becomes part of the DS Video Archive at the David Rubenstein Rare Book and Manuscript Library of Duke University. And I'm pleased to tell you it is the most watched site. According to Duke, it has over three million visitors. And I hope you will add to that number. And now to our program. British-born actress Jessica Tandy <coughs> She in London, England, and Canadian-born actor Hume Cronin, he in London, Ontario, were one of Broadway's leading husband and wife acting teams. And they met in 1940 in New York and married in 1942. Tandy was the daughter of commercial traveler Harry Tandy. To verify what the term meant, Google helped me. It is what we come to know as people who travel and sell their wares. And his, her mother, Jessie Horspool. She was only 18 when she made her debut in London, establishing her career opposite such renowned actors as John Gilbert and Laurence Olivier. Although she began her film career in London, after her first marriage failed, she moved to the United States and worked in film and theater. Cronin was a Canadian expat who abandoned the life of privilege for the stage. Born into the wealthy Labatt Brewery family, his father was a member of Canada's House of Commons and a financier. He was sent to private schools as a child and as the smallest person in the class was often bullied, so to defend himself, he learned to box, becoming proficient in the sport. He was nominated in 1932 for the Canadian Olympic boxing team, but he chose instead to leave McGill University and attend the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York. He made his Broadway debut as a janitor in 1934. He quickly became known for his versatility in a broad range of roles. After their marriage, Jessica Tandy and Hume Cronin became one of the foremost acting couples on Broadway, sometimes compared with the legendary Lunt Fontan marriage. But they were totally different personalities. Tandy and Cronin became one of the most important couples in 20th century theater and film, and the inevitable conflicts of any close relationship did not stand in their way. They each supported the success of the other, unless you tell us otherwise. <laughs> in 1946, Cronin, while on contract to MGM in Hollywood, directed Tandy in Portrait of Madonna by Tennessee Williams, a modest production 
in a small Los Angeles theater. There is a lesson here. Her brilliant performance led to her Tony Award winning role in the Broadway production of A Streetcar Named Desire in 1947, establishing Tandy's place as a star in the American theater. Cronin, who received five Tony nominations and later won a Tony for his role as Polonius, appeared in more than 40 feature films, including Hitchcock's Shadow of a Doubt, which was his film debut, The Zekefield Follies in 1946, People Will Talk, and They Will, 1951 with Cary Grant, and Seventh Cross in 1944 with Spencer Tracy, for which he received an Oscar nomination. On Broadway, the couple first appeared together in the four poster in 1951. They later delighted audiences in the gin game in 1977, and Foxfire in 1982, with Tandy winning a Tony for both performances. In 1986, when they played husband and wife in the petition, critic Frank Rich referred to, I'm going to quote him, their legendary theatrical relationship. Well, that same year, critic Mel Gussow called them two actors at their summit. They were both inducted into the Theater Hall of Fame in 1979 and together received the Kennedy Center Honors in 1986, the National Medal of the Arts in 1990, and in 1994, the first Tony Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Theater. In 1989, Tandy became the oldest actress to receive an Oscar for Best Actress in the Best Picture of the Year. You know what it was? Driving Miss Daisy. Driving Miss Daisy. <laughs> After Jessica Tandy's death in 1994, Mr. Cronin married Susan Cooper, a longtime friend and collaborator. Together they wrote his 1991 autobiography entitled A Terrible Liar. You'll have to explain that, please. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Memory is a terrible liar. Is that is where true. the title comes from. Accurate. Thank you. Cronin died in 2003, one month before his 92nd birthday. Together and apart, and for more than seven <coughs> decades, each and both came to exemplify publicly, although they were immigrants, the best of American artistry and now our distinguished speakers who know a great deal about them. Some by birth will speak to us. There is a scholar that we will begin with, Lily Barringer, <coughs> an author, educator, lecturer, and producer, as Dean Emerita of the College of Fellows, the American Theater. She's past president of the National Theater Conference and the American Theater Association, and now distinguished professor emerita of dramatic <coughs> arts at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she was formerly chairwoman of the Department of Dramatic Art and producing director of the Playmakers Repertory Company. A member of the League of Resident <coughs> Theaters, she received the 2009 Outstanding Teacher of Theater and Higher Education Award from the Association of Theater and the New England Theater Conference. Her comprehensive work on Jessica Tandy is a standard reference. Dr. Barringer is now writing a book about the theater legend Stella Adler in her own words. And now in Dr. Um, Barringer's work, words, she will tell us about Jessica Tandy. Welcome to you. Well, I think all of the good bits of what I wanted to say you have already heard. <laughs> so 
I will try to, to find a few things that maybe uh, I can add to what uh, the earlier presenter uh, has said. Um, over a period of 35 years, uh, both Jessica Tandy and Hugh Cronin appeared, as you know, separately and together in an extraordinary range of plays that found them in New York's Broadway theaters, on London's West End, and at the Old Vic. Toward the close of their careers, they celebrated with three national awards, the 1986 John F. Kennedy Center Honors Award, uh, the National Medal of Arts Award, presented by George W. Bush at the White House in 1990, and with the first, as you said, with the first Tony Lifetime Achievement Award, which was presented to them in 1994. Um, Jessica Tandy passed away at age 85 in early September of 1994, and in mid-September of that year, she received posthumously the New York State Governor's Arts Award. Hume Cronin accepted in her absence. Tandy's friends gathered at Broadway Schubert Theater to pay tribute to the London-born actress, along with Hume Cronin, her husband of 54 years. Her friends spoke from the stage of Tandy's dedication to her art, her integrity, her collaborations with her husband and other stage and film artists, along with her wicked sense of humor. <laughs> Canadian-born Hugh Cronin made his theater debut in 1931 playing a paper boy in the comedy Up Pops the Devil. I never heard of it. I can't tell you any more about it. <laughs> he studied at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, as you said, under Max Reinhardt, and made his Broadway debut in 1934 playing the now-forgotten comedy Hipper's Holiday. Can't tell you anything about Hipper's Holiday either. <laughs> In 1940, Cronin met Jessica Tandy, and they soon married. Their relationship as husband and wife lasted more than 50 <coughs> years. And moreover, they established a reputation for performing the classics and new works for the stage, and they also appeared in film and television. In 1946, Cronin directed his wife, as we have just heard, in Tennessee Williams' Portrait of a Madonna. The role earned the actress critical acclaim, whereupon the following year, she had achieved Broadway stardom as Blanche Dubois in The Streetcar Named Desire. Tandy and Cronin starred together for the first time in the, uh, the 1951 Broadway production of The Four Poster. Later there was A Delicate Balance, and then there was The Gen Game. For her performances in The Gin Game and also in Foxfire, Tandy won Tony Awards. Several years later, she received the Academy Award for Best Actress in Driving Miss Daisy. Theirs is a remarkable story of two extraordinary performers making stage history for over 50 years. Thank you. Our next guest is the executive director of the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts at Lincoln Center, actually my favorite building at Lincoln Center, both its design and its contents. Jacqueline Z. Davis once served as a staff assistant in the office of Senator Edward Kennedy. She was formerly the director of the Lead Center at the University of Kansas. She is a Tony Grant voter was a Tony Awards nominator. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> she is a Tony voter, was a Tony Awards nominator, and in 2013 chaired the Tony Awards Nominating Committee. She currently co chairs the subcommittee on the legacy and impact of women, of women in theater. In 2004, she received an Obie on her, for her work on the Imagine 04 Festival of the Arts. As you can tell, she has a very rich background in scholarly and practical. And we are very pleased to welcome her here today, I should add. She is also a Chevalier of Arts and Letters, a timely announcement to make today, given by the French Minister of Culture. And in May 2012, 
She was graduated from Harvard's Kennedy School Executive Leadership Program. She is very qualified to talk about almost anything. But today, we'll be Jessica Tandy and you, Carmen. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Carmen. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to have this opportunity on behalf of the Performing Arts Library at Lincoln Center, where we have a vision statement. And the vision statement is to ensure that the performing arts live. Uh, we're proudly part of the New York Public Library. Often people say, aren't you Lincoln Center? Well, we are at Lincoln Center, but we're part of New York Public Library. We've developed three pathways into the library for artists, writers, lifelong learners, and students who aspire to be part of the performing arts community today or someday. There are three active exhibition spaces, a 200-seat theater uh, that offers more than 250 events annually, and of course the most important element, that being the collections in music, dance, theater, and recorded sound. New York, as you know, is a mecca of the performing arts, and I can't imagine what the city would be like without theater, dance, music, and film that enrich all of us and create a cultural life unparalleled in any city, city that I have ever lived in. We're so pleased that much of the careers of Hume Cronin and Jessica Tandy are part of the holdings of the Performing Arts Library for all of our patrons to access and to learn about these extraordinary artists. Just think of it. How many couples can we say received a Lifetime Achievement Tony Award together a drama does special award for their continuing uh, partnership, and again, together, were inducted in the Theater Hall of Fame. That's an achievement unto itself. So here are some of the examples of these holdings in our research collections, many which you as family, friends, and fans uh, will recognize. So let's start. Recordings of their Broadway play, The Gin Game, and Foxfire in our Theater on Film and Tape archive, fondly known as TOP, and the Theater on Film and Tape archive is very special and unique because without these recordings, these live performances would be lost. And before they did exist, this project, they are lost. And they are only in the memories of those people who were fortunate enough to see them. So after the 70s, we began recording them. We currently have over 8,000 titles. Now, continuing along with what we have of theirs, a recording of a live 1955 telecast of their Broadway hit, The Four Poster, a recording of an evening with Tandy and Cronin held in the Performing Arts Library in 1987, unedited audio and video interviews with Tandy and Cronin recorded by various journalists and documentary filmmakers recordings of their appearances on the Tony Award broadcast, including a presentation of their Lifetime Achievement Award in 1994, unpublished notes on Tandy's A Streetcar Named Desire performance taken by both the director, Ilya Kazan and Cronin, producer Claire Nickturn's production files of Foxfire, that in 1983, letters by Cronin and or Tandy preserved in the papers of theatrical luminaries including Catherine Hepburn, Abe Burroughs, Joe Malziner, and Catherine Cornell. This is a lot and there's more. So I invite all of you to come to the Performing Arts Library and to view these materials and anything else you'd like to see. It's so wonderful that the medallion has been designated for their home. It's a message to all that these two extraordinary people are being recognized for their many contributions to the cultural life of New York and beyond. I'm really honored to be part of this very special celebration. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jackie. Frank Rich, well known to all of you, I presume, an American essayist, op-ed columnist, and currently writer at large for New York Magazine, was a critic, columnist, and senior writer at the New York Times from 1980 to 2011. He has written about culture and politics for many other publications, and his journalistic awards, issues, and ideas are very well known and widely recognized. He is currently a producer at HBO and received two Emmys in 2015 
and 2016 for the hit comedy Veep. How many of you have seen that? A lot. Well, he's busy right now filming for that program and was unable to join us. But he sent along the most generous and informed <coughs> appraisal of the work of Tandy and Cronin and their role in the development of American theater. And it was so beautifully written, so informed, we decided to share it with you without his presence. So we will give you the words of Frank Rich, read by Deborah Bershaw. Your dramatic guest, please. <laughs> <laughs> Give that to you at the end. It's In Broadway's 20th century golden age, there were more than a few married couples who played distinguished roles in theater history. From Alfred Lund and Lynn Fontaine to Helen Hayes and Charles MacArthur to Eli Wallach and Anne Jackson. But perhaps none had so far a reach or lasting an impact on the American theater as a whole as Hugh Cronin and Jessica Tandy. Separately, they gave legendary performances on New York stages, most notably Tandy as Blanche Dubois in Elia Kazan's original production of Tennessee Williams' A Streetcar Named Desire in 1947, and Cronin as Polonius in John Gilgold's 1964 modern dress staging of Hamlet, starring Richard Burton. Together, they took Broadway by storm, playing very different married couples in two character plays that bracketed their careers. Hartog's The Four Poster in 1951 and Coburn's The Gym Game in 1977. When they took their inevitable detours to Hollywood, they did so with similar aplomb. Both collaborated with Alfred Hitchcock and in Cronin's case as a writer as well as an actor. But perhaps their most significant achievement took place in a less glamorous venue than New York or Los Angeles, Minneapolis. In 1963, at the height of their show business success, they accepted an invitation from the director Tyrone Guthrie to join him there as the first actors in his new venture. The almost unheard of undertaking of starting a major theater company from scratch, far from either coast. Guthrie, a titanic English director who had his own flourishing New York career, had become disillusioned with the hit or miss psychosis of commercial theater. His recruitment of the Cronins would jumpstart his experiment, lending it credibility and enabling the enlistment of such other top actors as, as Alec Guinness and Irene Worth. In that first season in Minnesota, the Cronins variously and tirelessly took on major roles in The Miser, Hamlet, The Three Sisters, and Death of a Salesman. As Guthrie would later recall in a memoir, Jim Cronin and Jessica Tandy offered their services for the season. They would offer to our audience, and not less importantly, to other actors a re certain reassurance that standards were likely to be high. We all knew the Cronins well enough to count on them as responsible leaders of the company. The morale of a theater company is established and maintained by its leading actors. That company was pioneering, to say the least. It was founded five years before Joseph Papp could move his comparable dream into the public theater in New York. More than a half century later, the Guthrie survives as a major theatrical force, but from its inception, it served as a beacon and model for the national nonprofit resident theater movement that over the ensuing decades would proliferate to become the engine driving all American theatrical production. While memories of all great stage performances are destined to fade over time, this singular achievement never will. Its legacy can be found in every nonprofit theater in America. Though Jung Cronin and Jessica Tandy were born far from New York shortly after the turn of the last century, he in London, Canada, and she in London, England, their brilliant contributions to both their adopted city and country remain indelibly woven into the very fabric of American culture today. Frank Rich, April 2018. Can you send a copy of that, please, to Tandy Cronin, to Ms. Manning, and to you for your library. It is beautifully written, and I think 
comprehensive overview of the growth of regional theater in the United States and gives a terrific perspective and you praise. So thank you again in absentia, Frank Rich. <clears throat> and we're pleased now to introduce Julie Manning, a well-known community activist who has made her mark on New York before she became an official personage. We're especially pleased to welcome you. Julie is now the commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, an agency that works with the key economic and creative sectors of the film, television, theater, film, advertising, publishing, and increasingly digital content industries. She also oversees NYC Media, the largest municipal broadcaster entity in the United States. We're going to ask you about its audience, and you're going to tell us about that too, please. Her recent initiatives include the development, and this is significant, of a $5 million fund dedicated to women filmmakers and playwrights to help promote gender equality in these sectors and the creation of a sustain sustainable productions program, New York City Film Green, the first of its kind here in the United States. Commissioner Menon also led the negotiations that after a 15-year hiatus brought the Grammy Awards back to New York City this year. Quite an accomplishment. Thank you, Commissioner Menon, and welcome. Well, thank you so much, Barbara for that incredibly kind and generous introduction. And it's a tremendous honor to be here with all of you today, really to celebrate and honor the legacy of two tremendous New Yorkers. Um, now, I know that both Barbara Lee and the other speakers spoke about um, the fact that both uh, Jessica Tandy and Hume Cronin came, were not born in New York, but came from other countries. And I think that's such a New York story when we really think about it how many people came here and then really left an indelible mark. Um, I first of all want to extend uh, thanks on behalf of the City of New York to you, Barbara Lee, on everything that you do to continue to make sure that culture is so recognized and that um, cultural icons and figures in the city get the historical recognition that they deserve. And it's very important, I will tell you as a mother of three, that we really make sure that it's the next generations who make sure that they know about these figures and the indelible contributions that they have made. So um, certainly sometimes called America's first acting couple, Hugh Cronin and Jessica Tandy won just about every award and honor that is available to human beings, perhaps with the exception of the Nobel Prize. Um, so now they have uh, one more posthumous honor to add to their remarkable collection. And what I especially like about this particular award, the Cultural Medallion, is that it's truly an award for all New Yorkers, not to mention millions of visitors to enjoy for decades to come. Um, as I mentioned, like many New Yorkers, Jessica Hume were born somewhere else, uh, as many of us were. And also, like many New Yorkers, they were true workaholics, boasting careers that spanned literally decades and always searching for new projects uh, when they were not otherwise engaged. Um, certainly since our office celebrates, as Barbara Lee mentioned, both theater and film industries, and since many of the other speakers spoke so eloquently about their contributions in theater, I'm going to really concentrate very briefly on their contributions uh, in the cinematic world. So Cronin's first Hollywood movie was Hitchcock's Shadow of a Doubt in 1943. As screenwriter, as well as an actor, he worked on the screenplays of Hitchcock's A Rope and Under Capricorn. He was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor in the Seventh Cross in 1944. Four decades and dozens of projects later, he famously starred in The Cocoon, which my kids uh, really like, in 1985 followed by Batteries Not Included, then alongside his wife and in The Coon, The Return. And this, I think, is really remarkable. So big-hearted and intent on working was he that he was even known to accept parts in NYU film students' movies and to refuse payment. I think that's really incredible. 
Jessica Tandy appeared in more than 25 movies and played leading roles in numerous television programs as well. Directors loved working with her because, ironically, there was no drama with Jessica Tandy. She was known for her even-keeled serenity, her work ethic, and her sense of humor. She played Cronin's wife in four films, Honky Tonk Freeway, Cocoon, Batteries Not Included, and Cocoon The Return. Now, we all know Driving Miss Daisy in 1989 was a role that, at long last, um, earned her a Best Actress Oscar. And Cronin said at the time that with this role, she left him, quote, unquote, in the dust. She was 80 years old when she played Miss Daisy and became the oldest person to ever win the coveted award. Um, just a year before, she had won an Emmy for her performance in the television adaptation of Foxfire, and multi-talented Cronin was a co-writer. At 82 years old, she played an 82-year-old woman in Fried Green Tomatoes. And you might ask, why am I mentioning her age? Well, unfortunately, we all know in Hollywood that it uh, sometimes, unfortunately, becomes very difficult for women of a certain age to get such rich and deep, wonderful roles. And she clearly uh, was able to break that stereotype. One of their last projects together was to dance with the White Dog, a television movie. Both nominated uh, for Emmys, Cronin won the prize for his performance as a widower, mourning his wife. And by then, he was a widower. I know that I personally will always um, remember and smile when I come to East 35th Street and look up and see this wonderful cultural medallion reminding every passerby of the great first couple of acting who lived here and contributed so much to both American theater and film. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And now the perfect capstone to this wonderful program, I'd like to introduce Tandy Cronin, the daughter of Jessica Tandy and Hume Cronin. When you see her, you will not be surprised. <laughs> Prepared for her own theatrical career at London Central School of Speech and Drama. She, she debuted on Broadway in 1969, joining the cast of Cabaret as Sally Bowles. She's appeared frequently in film, including Once Upon a Time in America, The January Man, and Animal. On stage in such classics as An Enemy of the People, Antigone, and Much Ado About Nothing. Among her many television appearances, she played a recurring role on The Guiding Light, and in 2013, was nominated for Outstanding Actress in a lead role by the New York Innovative Theater Awards. She most recently appeared in Universal Robots at the Sheen Theater Center in New York City, just last a year or so ago. She's also a talented narrator of numerous audiobooks. We are more than pleased that she is joining us here today. Tandy Cronin. First of all, thank you to the Historic Landmarks Preservation Center for this delightful occasion. It's a singular honor to have this lovely brownstone remembered as the place where my parents lived. It's also a bit odd because we didn't live here for very long maybe just a couple of years. But that time marked an important milestone in my parents' professional lives. When Jessica Tandy and Hume Cronin married, although they were both stage actors, they settled in Los Angeles, and my brother Chris and I were both born there. Both my parents were under contract to uh, Hollywood Studios, and my father did quite well in character parts, working with Hitchcock, Fred Zinnemann, Joseph Mankiewicz. He got an Oscar nomination for his supporting role in The Seventh Cross. But he knew he would never be a leading man in films. And for my mother, it was worse. What she had to offer, Hollywood wasn't interested in. And the roles she won were limited and often dull. So when I was four or five years old, my parents made the very risky decision to move back east and return to the theater. 
I am personally so grateful that I got to grow up and be educated in New York rather than Los Angeles. <laughs> Thank you. We spent, the, when we moved to East, that we first moved to a house in Greenwich, Connecticut and spent a year there. And that didn't work out very well. I can remember my parents complaining. They were in different plays. So they said hello and goodbye, waved on the highway. So the next year, we moved into into the city. And it was, I guess, to this house, which I don't really recognize. I think it's been extensively renovated. But it was a wonderful and very comfortable and special place to live. So it was while we were living here that Jessica and Hume did their first Broadway show as a couple. And that was the four poster by Jan de Hartog, directed by Jose Ferrer. It was an enormous hit. And uh, it was a two-hander. And my father had found this, this script. I don't know where, but he was the one who actually nurtured it into its then great Broadway success. He saw it through numerous rewrites. Uh, they tried it out in summer stock. And then it, it uh, opened on Broadway where it was enormously successful. And having an, an, an enormous Broadway hit, in those days, the way a stage or a Broadway career works, if you had a hit on Broadway, you followed through with it, uh, doing at least a season on the road with it. Economically, that really worked. My brother and I got to go to very expensive schools. <laughs> so um, during the Broadway run, I remember having a particularly opulent Christmas here. My brother Chris was recovering from chicken pox, and my parents were so busy with the four poster that they hired a professional to do all their Christmas wrapping. <laughs> we were inundated with presents. The success of the four poster transformed our lives and started the Cronin's long and remarkable collaboration as a theatrical couple. They performed plays by Edward Albee, Samuel Beckett, Friedrich Dürrenmatt, among many others. And we lived here on 35th Street when it all began. Lucky me. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, thank you for that presentation. I'd like to take a moment and tell you about the porcelainized enamel medallions that will now be affixed to this building and to 115 other buildings throughout New York City. <clears throat> the program was originated by the Historic Landmarks Preservation Center, but it was really based on ideas formed on my travels around the world and realized that every other country and every other city recognized and admired those people who made the city what it is. And I am so interested in our architecture, long ago realized it's not only the design of the building, but most importantly, what goes on inside those dwellings that really counts. And New York City is a perfect workshop to explore that idea. So it was really based on the London Blue Marker program. And as I have mentioned, uh, they would say things like, Disraeli was born here, or Handel played in this alley. We gave the unexpurgated version and struggled with the fabricator at each encounter because there's always another phrase or another idea that should be included. Happily, in some ways, the size of the medallion, that like most everything we do, was designed by pro, pro bono by the internationally recognized prize-winning artist Massimo Vignelli, who also designed another program of ours, the Historic District Street Signs, so in each of the 141 historic districts throughout New York City, you will see terracotta black and white, like the color of this oval medallion that, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, 
excuse me, medallions that um, mark historic districts on each and every corner of that district. And now we have medallions that mark the residence of doctors, lawyers, military persons, athletes, inventors, actors, I did say, architects, many of the people in the arts, and anyone who has either invented an idea or something that has made not only New York, but often the world in which we live a better place. So I'm pleased now to tell you that this small ceremony completed, but not really, till we go downstairs. And I will ask Deborah to unveil, and Susan to unveil this little cultural medallion, and Tandy Perlman, with your wonderful actress's voice, who will give you a script to practice on the way downstairs. <laughs> and you will read the text. Yes, we heard Thank you all, to each and all of you, for coming today. So get yourselves up and we'll see you all on the stairs. 113 East 35th Street in Manhattan. British-born actress Jessica Tandy and Canadian-born actor Hume Cronin, one of Broadway's leading husband-wife acting teams, met in 1940 in New York and married in 1942. In 1946, Cronin directed Tandy in Portrait of a Madonna by Tennessee Williams leading to her Tony Award-winning role in A Streetcar Named Desire, 1947. Cronin later won a Tony for his role as Polonius in Hamlet, 1964. The couple first appeared together in The Four Poster, 1951, and delighted audiences in The Gin Game, 1977, and Foxfire, 1982, for which Tandy won two Tonys. Tandy received an Oscar for Best Actress in Driving Miss Daisy, 1989. Both actors were inducted into the Theatre Hall of Fame, 1979, and together received the Kennedy Center, the Kennedy Center Honors, 1986, the National Medal of Arts, 1990, and the first Tony Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Theatre, 1994 historic landmarks preservation center, Murray Hill Neighborhood Association. Yay!